Greetings, I'm John Duvall. Welcome back to another Truth Factor discussion. We hope that you're having a wonderful week and are ready to jump into John chapter 5. That's where we'll start here in just a moment. Now, if this is the first time that you've joined us for our study, we'd love, for you, we'd love to hear your thoughts on these matters. If you are viewing this via our Facebook page, then you can use the comment section connected with this live video to let us know what you have to think. If you're watching this on our YouTube channel, same thing there, but use the chat area for this. What we'd invite you to do is to like and subscribe or to follow if you find these studies uh, beneficial, if you find them useful, and that way you can keep up with the things that we do. You can also send us email, send it to questions at truthfactorlive.com. All right, let me bring everyone in. Gentlemen, y'all doing all right today? Doing well. <laughs> yes, um, I'm here. I'm here. So. Doing, doing good? Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Okay, let's see. So we're picking up in John chapter 5, and um, we're going to pull our thoughts about the miracle at the pool of Bethesda. Would that work? Segway I, of I, sorts? I, yeah. So, Future jokes and dad jokes, the best kind of jokes there are. Sometimes they're one and one, hand in hand, aren't they? Um, okay, so what we'll do is go ahead and jump into this. Let's start reading in verse number one. And um, a little bit kind of a lengthy reading. I, let's break this up just a moment. So what we'll do is we'll read one through six and discuss it, and then we'll continue here in the section. Um, Tom, would you mind reading for us today? That's not a problem. Uh, uh, chapter 5, verse 1, and I will be reading from the New King James Version. Okay. So we read there. Uh, after this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. And whoever, then whoever stepped in first, after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Now a certain man was there who had an infirmity 38 years. Go ahead and read. Um, well, okay, that's a good stopping point. Yeah, that, that works out a little bit better there. All right, so Tom, we have a very interesting um, miracle that takes place here. Um, archaeologists believe they have identified this pool. Is that correct? Or at least what they believe to be um, this particular pool. Oh, uh, yeah, you know, absolutely. You know, when it comes to, uh, when it comes to archaeology, there are some things that they can, with pinpoint accuracy, know what it is and where it is. But in other circumstances, you know, they're left they're left to guess, or you know, or, and 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 when we say guess, it's not just a blind guess. It, yeah. it, it's an educated guess, and it's a and it's a guess by somebody who holds a whole, knows a whole lot more about these things than I do. So you know, you can um, you can have respect for. It. But yeah, I mean it. Uh, um, they believe that they have identified where this particular pool would have been. And so th that is an observation. Now, there's interesting points tied to this text. I don't know if you have a question or you want me to deal with it. I'm taking it from a, from a contextual standpoint, one of the things that has to be addressed. Well, we'll get, we'll get there in just a moment. Yeah, we, we'll, we'll get to that. Um, and it looks um, like Ryan has found the sheep gate or the pool. <laughs> Now, see, why are you doing it that way? He's on location. He is on location. No, I'm, I'm not actually, uh, I'm actually, the uh, host denies my rights to share video to share my screen, so I have to do it oh, the old-fashioned way. I didn't know you wanted to share a screen. Well, I wasn't going to ask. I just thought I'd show a quick, quick picture. Just kind of, well, well, here, I, I did all this bless work. His heart, but Brian, bless his heart, but Brian is just a little bit presumptuous, but... But, but That's right. Ahead. It was a little presumptuous. Yeah. Yeah, but go ahead. <laughs> See, I did. I I set up my system to share a picture that I found on the internet. So it's got to be the sheep gate. I don't know if it is, but it says it is. But but I would have. I would have. I would have uh, done your screen share had I known that, Brian. Um. 
anyway, so not really relevant other, other than the fact it was a real place. Okay. One of the thousands of reasons why we believe the, the, the writings of the new Testament, um, has to do with the fact that archeology span supports the, the people, the places, the events that are recorded within the scriptures. And this is one of those cases here, just kind of the purpose there, bringing that up there. Um, and, 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 ahead, and of course, a point to be made with that from an evidential standpoint is, mm -hmm. uh, to my understanding, there has not been a location that contradicts what the Bible says. There are a yep. lot of locations that we do not know where they are at specifically. But, but you know, sometimes the critic will talk about, well, the Bible mentions this place. And, you know, I mean, they even they even made observation about David not being real, you know, yeah. uh, for, for years and so on. But then all of a sudden, they have some kind of a document or some kind of a, of, of a rock with writing on it proves that what the Bible said was accurate. So, so ev right. everything that has been unearthed based upon the Bible has been, has or verifies the accuracy of what the Bible says. While we're talking about this pool real quick, uh, Javon in or Jeevan in the chat room asks the following question and I don't, I don't have an answer for it right now. Is there any evidence about this pool? I guess, is there any evidence about this pool in the old Testament? Kind of like, you know, when, when we get past the, um, the return from Babylonian captivity, well, no, there really wouldn't be uh, unless the pool existed prior to, um, the it, it, it is being conquered in Jeremiah. Uh, Jeremiah, let me bring that up. Real quick. Or Nehemiah, maybe it's Nehemiah, but, uh, I lost it there for a second. Let me see if I can get back to it. That's a good question. I hadn't really. Well, it's about the sheep. That. The sheep gate is mentioned in Nehemiah. I know that, so I didn't know if the pool was, but I know the sheep gate is mentioned in Nehemiah. Nehemiah oh, three. Yeah, yeah. So the pool would have been by the sheep gate. So, the, so I guess the question would be when they rebuild it, and I'll pop the the Nehemiah text up here. Uh, there we go. Then Eliashib, the high priest, rose up with his brethren, the priests, and built the sheep gate. They consecrated it and hung its doors, and they built as far as the tower of the hundred and consecrated it. Then as far as the tower of Hanel, or, or Han, Hananel. So a lot, it has to do with where they built it. But then, <laughs> i got to be careful how I say this. Their thoughts about the healing properties of the pool probably did not form until sometime during the 400 year period, sometime after the return, um, during, you know, during that time period would be my guess is when that belief, uh, developed. Do you think that'd be a safe assumption? Cause the MI doesn't mention anything about people thinking about the special nature of that body of water or that pool. Yeah, no, no, Nehemiah three is just simply describing the rebuilding of the walls and yeah. dividing it down by sections. That's, that's all Nehemiah is doing there. Is this, is this in any way connected with the waterway that Hezekiah built to bring water in during the siege? I, I think it's a different place. I, 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 yeah, I, I think that's different. Yeah, so I'm reading up right now. Oh, go ahead, Bob. Numbers 1239 mentions the fish gate in connection with the sheep gate. So, why would there be a fish gate unless there was a pool there for the fish? <laughs> I noticed that uh, reading some of the archaeology uh, uh, take on it, that they think it's, a, it's an artificial pool, that it's not like a, a spring where they mm -hmm. uh, dug out a spring, but they created the pools. Um, it says they have some dams and some tanks that are uh, found in that area associated with it. So okay. um, th that would probably indicate that it could have been built any time. In other words, it wasn't a natural feature like uh, like the pool that um, the the spring that uh, Nehemiah digs down to is a spring. It's actually yeah. a you know a, you know uh, a natural water feature. This was not. This was something artificial. And we know the Romans loved those kind of things. So it could have been a Roman feature, um, potentially a Greek feature. Probably you know so very likely it wasn't built. Um, in the time uh, uh, until until close to the time of Christ, and was it built because 
not because of, well, I was going to say because of verse three, in these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind people, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. And we'll discuss that here in just a moment. But because of its location, you had a wide number of sickly people who would be there in that region too. Oh no, having five porches, it also says. So in answer to Stephen's question, not sure. Go ahead, Brian. I was just going to say, it looks like there uh, there might have been some um, pagan. Um, he, this might have been a pagan area too. That the that the again the Romans might have built some of this as well in the area. For and it, interestingly enough, they call it an Asipian, which was a healing pool. So mm -hmm. that's kind of an interesting thing. If that was what the uh, that the the Gentiles believed this was an area for healing as well. Okay. Well, that could go back to the period of Antioch, Antioch Epiphanes the Fourth, around mm -hmm. one, what was it, forty-seven BC or one sixty-four BC, something like that. There, the, the the point is the the his introduction of the Greek culture, and through the whole region there, um, could have been also the time period, and this is connected to what you were talking about, Brian, there in, in that article there, that it could have come from Gentile sources as far as this this type of belief or something um james dodd says in reference to isaiah chapter 22 there in verse 9 let me bring this up here he says you also saw the damage to the city of david that it was great and you gathered together the waters of the lower pool there's another is a reference there to a pool there within the city of david which this of course was the city of david yeah it's a possibility a possibility all right so in this, now the reason why they were waiting by the pool, all right, and uh, Tom, I'll throw this back to you. I think, was this the area you want to talk some about? We, we, we will label yes. Paul, Tom as the heretic here in just a moment, Brian and Bob, so we don't, we're off the hook here. Um, but the reason why it says, it says the reason why they were gathered here by this water, it says waiting for the moving of the water. And this is the New King James translation. Now, why were they waiting there for the water to move? Well, the text that we're reading from says, for an angel went down at a certain time to the pool and stirred up the water. And we know the rest of the story. First one in gets healed, okay? Whatever diseases he had, this is what they believed. Tom, what are your thoughts on that? Right, well, well, well based on what you said, uh, you know, there is a footnote in most versions, if not all, you know, all versions that put them in there, that this is omitted from some of the earlier manuscripts. And I, I haven't looked up the dating of exactly when this was added. Um, but the point is, is from a, uh, if you look at some of the later versions, they will make a distinction. I think I was just looking at the, like, like the American Standard and it puts it in parentheses. There may be versions out there that actually leave these verses out because they're not in the older manuscripts. And more than likely, this is one of those passages that I think this section was more than likely added by, added by a scribe at a later time. Now, when, I don't know. And I do not necessarily dismiss it as not being truthful, and the reason why is when we get to the next section in verse number seven, there has to be a reason why uh, the lame man is expressing frustration that he couldn't get into the pool. You know, uh, I mean, uh, there was obviously something about these waters that at a certain time, there was at least the belief that the first person that got in there was somehow going to be healed. You can't deny that. It's just exactly how that happens. So a scribe has put this in place, possibly, toward the end. And, and, and bear in mind that a lot of these scribal uh, editions and so on, uh, they are later, but they're a whole lot earlier than us. And, and what I mean by that is uh, there's a higher likelihood that they had a reliable source that caused them to put this in. We're speculating when we say that, but there's a greater probability that there's a reason he put this here. Now, it could be because it was passed down tradition 
somebody said and he was just adding it to it. Or it could be that he had some kind of a manuscript that goes back to the first two or three centuries that we no longer have because it disintegrated or was destroyed or whatever. So that's the observation. But in some texts, this verse is not there, but it serves as a potential explanation of why, uh, why this man was here. Yeah. And I do want to clarify for those who have joined us, or if you're watching this at a later time, we're not questioning at all the authenticity of the healing of the, um, the lame man here. Okay. Right. And the record of that miracle, we're not questioning that yeah. whatsoever. Um, yeah. Or his frustration. Exactly. One, one commentary I was studied years ago suggested, and it's just a suggestion here. That, and this goes back to what time you were saying that maybe as a marginal note, someone had written in the, what they were copying that, According to what they've studied, they were there because they believed the waters were troubled by an angel. And then some point in the course of the, you know, 1400 years or whatever, that marginal thought was then put into the text. It's all speculation. Well, what makes this such an odd question is, and, and Brian, we were talking about this a little bit earlier before we started. started. What, what is so unique about this believed miracle as far as what they were waiting on to happen? Oh, well, it's um, what the idea is, is that typically miracles only occur uh, in in a, a attempt to reveal some kind of truth from God. So revelation, miracles always come with revelation. Miracles always come with uh, a purpose. Um, and there's really just no such thing as a random, haphazard, spontaneous miracle that just sometimes occurs in Scripture, except for here. So that's it just doesn't really fit in with yeah. the normal understanding about why miracles would happen. It could have it's happened a, exactly the way that he thought it was going to happen. Yeah, but it's, yeah, it could. It's just different. But, yeah, yeah. Bob. I just want to say that the idea that this is something that is real would contradict the biblical principle of he that is first shall be last, and he that is last. Uh, shall be first. Yeah, it is odd that you would have a miracle that would, um, you know, would require you to be the first in line. You know, that is, uh, Bob's got a good point, actually. I think it is kind of an odd thing. That's the way man mankind would write a story. Right, right. You right. know, just, we're going to show a little bit of grace on the people, so we'll do this one time. First one in, next day we'll start at the same time, first one in. Um, but was there, I was going to say that there's no other accounts in the Bible where an angel performs a miracle. But that's not technically accurate because isn't an angel attributed to having slayed an army of a million? Yeah, the Syrians, yeah, 200,000 Syrians. Syrians. Yeah. yeah. 185,000. Um, so Peter from prison. Yeah. Okay. What's yeah, that? Get him out of prison? There was an angel with a sword that stopped yeah. Balaam that the donkey yeah. saw. So, I mean, yeah. so, so angels did yeah. something. Yeah. But uh, something like this, though, it would be, it's possible. But it's also possible that this is simply saying what they believed was going to happen. And that's why he was there. Um, but in modern day times, it, I mean, we, we, how many times do we see people claiming to have witnessed a fake healing? Are they are so certain that they're going to be healed that they're of, of a mental ability to push through whatever challenges because they really believed at the moment they were healed. Could be the same way. People were always going down into the water. And maybe some people came up feeling better, or at least seeming to feel better. And that just propagated this idea even more so. Sorry, Bob. Well, you, you, you know, when you think about that, and, and that makes me think, you know, from this standpoint, you know, uh, Brian was talking earlier about springs and so on, uh, mm -hmm. that, that some believe that this was a, a man-made pool. And I don't deny that, but I suspect if it was a man-made pool that it was attached to a spring somehow. In other words, that it was built by, because, uh, uh, you know, we can look through history and, and we can see the idea of, and I'm talking about world history, mm -hmm. we can see the ideas of pools, especially springs, were used as a source of healing. Uh, there were Indians that did that in, in, uh, Amer in, in America, you know, in previous yeah. times. Um, I used to live in Arkansas. And uh, my boys were born in Hot Springs, Arkansas. And if you know anything about Hot Springs, if you've ever been there, 
there's Hot Springs National Park. And what that is, is a park that is built around a natural hot springs. And, and a part of that park is what they, they have, is what they call Bathhouse Row, which basically dates back to the first half of the 1900s, so the 20th right. century. And there was all these bathhouses that they built because people would go there to feel better. And, and so I, I, I could see that as something that back in the time of Rome, that's what, uh, that's what they were dealing with, you know, during the first century. The odd thing of what they were, what he mentions is that apparently the same time every day, the water was troubled or almost implies some sort of inlet of water, something to stir or something to, and they thought an angel was doing it based on the, maybe. If, if he's describing a physical observation, um, let's see. Look like Bob has his had his hand up. We'll come back to him here in just a moment. He also had his hand up in real life too. <laughs> Go ahead, Bob. If... Uh, sorry, I was talking to the maintenance man. Oh, you're good. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, I, I when I was at Florida College, several of us went to a healing service and we actually saw uh, a young a young lady healed of bursitis right before our eyes <laughs> and so, uh, you know i can imagine that people with uh psychosomatic illnesses or people who just didn't feel good they yeah. get down to the waters and well i feel better already Kind of reminds me of Ernest Ainsley. I don't know. Y'all know about Ernest Ainsley? A miracle, a miracle healer, uh, supposedly. And, uh, you know, there's all kinds of men around claiming, of course, he's, he's long dead now, but uh, claiming to be performing uh, miracles. But when you compare their teaching with the teaching of the Bible, uh, we know that they are not really doing miracles because God wouldn't give them miracles when they're teaching uh, something different from what he revealed. Let me see, Bob. Is this the guy? You won't be able to see it on the stream, I guess. Um, let's see if I can do a screen share real quick. Huh? You posting a picture of Ernest Ainsley? Yeah, let's see if I can share it with us. I've already got it on the live stream. Oh, wow. Like the oh, picture, too. There you go. Yeah. So this guy, Bob. Yeah. I can feel the power, Tom. You just hit me with it. Is that him? Can you see it? Or did it share right? Uh, yeah. Now, he was a little older than that when I saw him. So that is an awfully, uh, awfully old picture. Now, that's yeah. Peter Paul. Oh, that's not uh, Ernest Ainsley. Okay, all right. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> it kind of it kind of favors him, but uh, yeah. <laughs> at any rate, yeah, he uh, he healed this boy that couldn't talk, and he asked the boy to say "baby." The boy couldn't could not uh, bless his heart. He could not uh, enunciate at all, and he just babbled. And he he cast the demon out said, say baby again. He said the same thing. And Ernest Ainsley tells his parents, you take him home and let him practice and he'll be talking as good as you before you know it. <laughs> That's, That's good advice. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, people at home. You're looking at me for just a moment. I had it. I messed up the Zoom meeting for half a second with that screen share. Let's see if I can get this fixed back right. One more time. Okay, so anyway, that being said about that, I just thought it was interesting to kind of talk about the different ideas and to to say what we're saying is not her heretical or any form or fashion. Um, so let's move on to what's most important here. Jesus comes to this gentleman, and let's continue in our reading. Tom, you read the first part there. The man was about 38 years old. So, um, what? Yeah. John, we have a couple of thoughts here. Or, or, uh, one, one more thought I wanted to tie in before you move on. Okay, just, go just, ahead. just from an evidence standpoint, well, while we're dealing with this text, uh, understand that critics often will point to things like this in Scripture to question the validity of the Scriptures. 
And the thing about it is, is we don't avoid these controversies and, 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 you know, keep that, keep that in mind, you know, acknowledge, yeah, I realize that there's a potential discrepancy here as, as far as the manuscripts and so on. We're not burying it. We're not trying to hide that, but it doesn't take away from the overall account and it doesn't take away from the overall message. If somebody doesn't like this verse, okay, let's, let's just not use it. And, and how's that going to change the gospel? Right. It's not. So, and so I just think that's a good evidence this point. Let me say this too, and it may have already been said while I was occupied, uh, but uh, from the from the word waiting uh, in verse three uh, until the end of verse four is all bracketed in the uh, uh, the uh, LSB. Uh, yeah and other translations as being an addition and and again as as has been pointed out there's there would be no purpose served in such a miracle uh without some revelation being uh being given and so i, th I think we need to uh to finish with that before we go on to the next text and i think just to uh, give something, people at home, something to hold on to from that, those two verses. All right. Brian, you got a thought? I, I had, yeah, I did. One quick comment. I've heard some good sermons on this <clears throat> based out of verse six that uh, Jesus is looking at this man, sees the condition, and Jesus asks him the question, do you want to be made well? And at first that might sound like a, a rhetorical or a nonsensical question. Here he is waiting at the pool. Um, you know, he has this ailment. But Jesus still asks if he wants to be made well. Um, and I've heard, as I said, some good sermons about the idea of, do you want to be made well? You know, how how serious are you about pursuing the healing for your spiritual condition? Or is it the case, maybe you want to keep your sickness? Maybe you want to hang on to it? And it might have seemed like a strange question at first, but there might be something that we want to uh, consider about that. Okay. Also consider that a great multitude of sick people were, were trying to get down into the water. How, how, why would God make a miracle so difficult that the people who needed the miracle most would be least able to get down into the water before, uh, you know, when it first started churning? Well, it's not without precedent. Think about the, 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 the brazen serpent on the rod that people actually had to, who were sick by the snake bite, was it snake bite? Had to, had to, had to actually look upon that rod. That, but Bob, I agree what, with what you're saying though. Yeah. But, but there was nothing, no impediment that would make it any more difficult for anybody else unless they were already they were all, dead. They were all stricken the same. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so they all were, yeah. were dying of the same. And so there was no, I don't yeah. reckon there were any degrees of serpents or worse serpents than others, but that's, that's, uh, that's just another point that, that I thought yeah. about it. Uh, it would really make, it seemed to me to make God a respecter of persons, uh, to send an angel to stir the waters and the people who would need to be healed the most, not be able to get down in there. Yeah. Why not just let everybody be healed? That, that's, I mean, that was what Jesus did. He healed everybody that came to it. Yeah. I don't think there's ever a, a, an example where somebody came to him for healing that he didn't heal them uh, or, or turn them yeah. away. Mm -hmm. Um, That's true. That's a good point. And Brian, you were t you, your point was about the lesson of his desire to be made well. Okay. So why didn't Jesus, if, if this is again, an argument, I guess, towards, if it was a legitimate miracle, why didn't Jesus just take him down into the water? You know, why did Jesus say, well, let's wait here until it, it stirs again. That'll take you down in there. Myself, you know, weather man was pretty okay. heavy. <laughs> like he the weather man pretty... was, <laughs> <laughs> well, the man was pretty heavy. Yeah. <laughs> here you go. Um, okay. Jesus and Jesus wouldn't need to drag him down to the water. 
But, exactly. Uh, yeah. Uh, so again, to me, this kind of lampoons the whole thing. You really want to be made well? Don't worry yeah. about these waters. That's right. Just take your bed and walk. Yeah. Uh, not that he could have done that without Jesus telling him that, but uh, this, to me, he's saying this is useless here. Yeah. But now we, we go back. We go back to the purpose of miracles. These things are written so that you might believe. All right. The confirmation of the word. Someone may try to argue, why didn't Jesus heal everybody that was there? Well, we don't know what he did. Okay. But the point here is this was done so the man would believe. And John uses it as one of many, what, seven miracles? Is that what we've said before in the book, Gospel yeah. of John? He uses it in such a way to prove those who prove to those who are reading his gospel layer, later, sorry, that Jesus was God. That he kind of interesting too that a lot of story. a lot of the miracles in John surround water, like the yeah. miracle at Cana and Galilee. We haven't got to it in John nine, but the pool of Siloam here. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of interesting yeah. water conversations and uh, the live, and then there you've got the living water, you've got the water that comes out of Jesus' side. So kind of interesting yeah. how water has a unique connection here. That's a good point. David yeah. uh, Clark makes a good thought. He says he didn't ever, he did not go into the water. Jesus told him to arise and walk. That's what God, you know, that's what he was told to do. You know, he never went to the water. He was healed by Jesus. Yeah. I right, go ahead, Tom. Sorry. Yeah. You know, you know, building on that point that Brian made, you know, I've, I've heard some great sermons, you know, asking the question, do you want to be made well? And, and you know, it, it's an interesting, it's an interesting application. You know, as, as you give consideration, why would somebody not want to be made well? Well, if they had become dependent, you know, one of the things that would be obvious based on our understanding of society, uh, all these people, they probably were depending on others to support them. In, in other words, more than likely, this was one of those gathering places where people would come and they would give them money or, or, or give them food or help them in one way or another. And those that had compassion for them. And, you know, uh, uh, the observations made with that particular lesson, do you want to be made well? Uh, think about the changes in this person's life. You know, others have been supporting him. You know, he had he had people that would carry him to the pool every day. Obviously, he didn't have a job, you know, un unless you want to call the the guy standing at the exit with the sign help. You know, I mean, I mean, that would be the extent of it or selling pencils, or, which I've, I've seen before. He obviously didn't do that. But now Jesus said, you want to be made well? You know, you realize if you be made well, you're going to become more functioning in society. You're going to need to start providing for yourself. You can't come down here and depend on others anymore. There's a lot of people that might say, you know what? I know I'm miserable, but I'm happy in my misery. Or I'm not willing. Um, I would rather be miserable the way that I am than to make the changes that are necessary if I do change. And a lot of people realize the hard changes. And, of course, the application of this is us spiritually you know there are people who are in sin caught up in sins and do they really want to be healed you know do they really do they really want to change are they are, are they willing to face the consequences and the difference when the change takes place are they willing to put forth the effort that is necessary to overcome uh, say it's an addiction of some sort, you know, you know, uh, say it's some sort of a moral addiction that somebody's dealing with. Do they really want to go through the process that's involved in overcoming whatever that is? And so uh, that's the power of this particular statement here. And it's a thought provoking question. Do I really want to be made well? You know, when I'm dealing with something. Okay. Well, let's go ahead and read. Let's, let's go ahead and read it. You stopped earlier at verse number five. Brian, if you would start number six, and let's go ahead and read down through verse 15, if you would. All right, just one second. Um, mm -hmm. And as I get it, uh, New King James, that's verses six through 16, correct? Uh, through <coughs> or 15, 
Yeah. 16 to be 5. Okay. Too. Yeah. So okay. Uh, when Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he'd already been in that condition for a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, sir, have no man to put me into the water when the water is stirred up. But while I'm coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed and walked. That day was the Sabbath. The Jews therefore said to him who was cured, it is the Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to carry your bed. And he answered them, well, he who made me well said to me, take up your bed and walk. Then they asked him, who is the man who said to you, take up your bed and walk? But the one who was healed did not know who it was. For Jesus had withdrawn a multitude being in that place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, see, you have been made well. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus who made him well. For this reason, the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him because he had done these things on the Sabbath. All righty. Thank you, Brian. So and, and an interesting thing to note in our discussion about verses uh, three and four or verses four, verse four. If you read skipping from three to five, it flows. You know, waiting for the moving of the water. Now a certain man was there who had infirmity. When Jesus saw him lying there, knew that he'd been there in that condition. Um, and so we've talked real, we've had a good conversation about the question to him, do you want to be made well? Um, Brian, so the man is still in this belief that he needs to be in, to, in the water there. What is amazing here is the fact that Jesus says to him, rise, take up your bed and walk. And he does, you know, what was it about Jesus, about this conversation, about the situation that instantly told the man that he was made well? Yeah. It's interesting because he doesn't know who Jesus is either. It's not as though he says, yeah. well, I know this is Jesus and Jesus is a you know well-known uh, prophet and healer. Um, there's just, you know, uh, if, if you've been crippled all your life, you're laying there and somebody says, why don't you just get up and walk? And, you know, why don't you take a walk off a, a short or long pier, short pier, you know? Uh, you might kind of be upset if someone says, how dare you say, I just, I can't just yeah. take up my, but whatever it is, I mean, as a matter of faith, that's kind of a neat thing with this miracle and the pool of Siloam miracle is in both instances, the guys do what Jesus said, you know, Jesus tells the guy at the pool of Siloam, go wash in the pool of Siloam. The guy tells, Jesus tells this man, just get up and walk, you know, and the guy just gets up and walks and, um, you know, it really is, it's something. And by the way, in both miracles, what's interesting is Jesus kind of steps out of the scene um almost right away so that at the pool of siloam the man never saw jesus you know he until jesus finds him later like in this in this event too the man has never actually seen jesus now this man has of course not being blind he has seen jesus but jesus then disappears what goes away and so when he gets questioned about these things um he said well you know the guy who healed me told me to do it so he must have been able to tell me to do it i mean he couldn't have healed me if that wasn't the case. That's kind of the blind man's argument too. Well, you know, clearly if this guy has the power to, yeah. to make me see, then this guy has the power to tell me what to do. So our minds you know, wonder about so many things with this. What did the other people, how did they react who saw this? You know, the people who, if he'd been coming regularly and they saw him walk away, you know, a lot of unanswered yeah. questions. Sorry, Bob. Go Anybody ahead, wonder how he got there? Oh yeah. There's a good question. Who brought him and dropped him off? Yeah, it, yeah, it being a Sabbath. Yeah. Somebody somebody did, but uh, couldn't hang around, I guess, for whatever reason. Uh, but uh, it seems to me uh, also that Jesus speaks with authority. And when somebody speaks with enough authority and tells you, get up and walk, you don't just, you don't say, take a long walk, walk off a short pier. <laughs> You stand up and walk because this man tell. And then when you realize you, and, and maybe he could perceive that he was no longer uh, an invalid uh, before rising up and walking. Uh, because it says immediately the man was made well, took up his bed and walked. And perhaps he perceived that he had been made well and that he could stand up and walk. And so he stood up and walked. 
And his defense, when the Jews come and says, uh, what are you doing carrying your bed? Well, the guy that healed me told me to do it. And so, uh, yeah, I did it. <laughs> and so if he had the power to, to heal me, he certainly had the authority yeah. to tell me to take up my bed and walk. Well, Bob, you, you touch on a point that I think we oftentimes don't, we should probably talk more about about what is involved in the healing process, okay? If you had someone who, who's lame, he's not been able to walk forever, how long? You've got a weakness of the legs, you've got atrophy. There's so much there. Nowadays, if you were to lay in bed for two months and not walk, you'd probably have to go through physical therapy. You'd have to get your strength built back up. And then if he had ever walked before, let's assume he had never walked before. We don't know that the, in this case in point, I don't remember it saying that he was this way from birth. Um, you have the lack of knowledge within your mind, like a baby has to learn how to walk and things of that nature. So there's a lot within the phrase was made well. And Bob, you may be right. It very well could be that he instantly felt the difference, felt better, felt stronger legs. I mean, you know. And there's a similar instance in Acts chapter 3, mm -hmm. where Peter and John are in the temple, and there's a man who had never walked. Yeah. And he was 40 years old Had never walked. We don't know whether he was born with the in inability to walk or uh, whether uh, an accident befell him before he learned to walk. Uh, we, we, maybe he was a breech birth and his legs were broken in delivery. Uh, but when they told him to take up his bed and walk, he took up his bed and walked yeah. and he could jump also he didn't have to go home and practice walking yeah uh, like some of the jump. he did jump like some of the tv miracles someone's trying to get up out of the wheelchair and it takes a couple minutes they're all shaky and everything you know i think they probably learned from that because i think some of the the other ones i've seen they get up and run around and jump up and down and so and we need to learn to say tv miracles Use those air tv quotes. that's a valid point yeah yeah these are paid for TV miracles. We pay the people who we heal. And you know, and, and the, Jesus didn't do that. And the apostles, they didn't right. go around uh, holding uh, 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 miracle services. Uh, you know, send advanced men in to, uh, to rent uh, 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 a forum or, or some yeah. sort of a place to or a tent, set up a tent. We're going to have a healing service. And so come one, come all. Uh, they just went and started preaching. And when somebody came to them for healing, they healed them. Or as in the case of John and Peter in, in Acts 3, uh, the healing took place first. And I think uh, Brian mentioned this in, in the pre-show conversation. Uh, the healing took place first and then the crowd gathered and the preaching was done. And so here's, and, and again, we don't know whether Jesus healed anybody else on this occasion or not. As you pointed out, John, it just doesn't say, uh, it may be that everyone else, that no one else really had the desire that this man had. Good me. That's a good point. Um, okay. Any other thoughts about this before we kind of, as we continue through the section here? Um, May I have one more comment? Oh, yeah. Go ahead, Tom. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, I was just going to make the observation about the Sabbath. I don't know how much you're going to talk about that, but but bear in mind. you know, That was my next point. Yeah. They were going to be <laughs> critical of him about the Sabbath. And I, make as you start talking about the Sabbath, understand this. Jesus did not violate the Sabbath by what he did. You know, I, I mean, I always find it am amazing. You know, when you talk about the miracles that Jesus performed and, and the, the hypocritical leader saying, you know, there are six days, there are six days, go come heal, be healed on those days. I, I just asked the question, how much effort was involved in Jesus healing somebody? You know, I mean, I mean, I, you know, Jesus speaks and it happens. You know, can you talk on the Sabbath? Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, that's really the bottom line. And what he told him to do, it wasn't work. 
they may have defined it as work, but it wasn't the Sabbath's definition of you shall do no work. Yeah. And I, I was going to add uh, on a similar note, too, that the significance of this miracle of Jesus having performed it on the Sabbath is going to come back months or years later because there in John chapter 7, uh, they're pursuing, you know, in just a few verses, we're going to read that they're going to start wanting to kill him for this. Um, in John chapter 7, which is some time, kind of a considerable amount of time later, they're still talking about this miracle because they're saying Jesus is talking about the idea, I healed a man on the Sabbath, um, you know, um, verse 23 of John chapter 7, um, you know, uh, you're, ma you're angry with me because I made a man completely well on the Sabbath. I was, like I said, months or potentially even years before uh, to connect to this miracle. So it's kind of interesting that this miracle seems to stick with uh, their their being angry about it um, for some time. I always find that kind of interesting. Yeah. And it seems to me that except for the resurrection, the only time it is ever pointed out what on what day a miracle occurred, it was a Sabbath day. Uh, and and this was because this is was always the opportunity that the the rulers were looking for uh, to make Jesus look bad accusing him to work on this. Of course, he, he pointed out on one occasion, well, does the priest work on a Saturday when he circumcises your infant son uh, on the seventh day of his birth? Uh, aren't there priestly services, or priestly prayers that take place on the Sabbath day? Does the, does the priest violate the Sabbath? Uh, you get your donkey out of the ditch. Is that working or you leave him down in there? No, you you get them out, and uh, and I and I I've heard it used also ox in the ditch as a uh, excuse not to come to services. Well, you know my ox was in the ditch. Sooner or later, we we need to uh, sell the ox, fill the ditch, or put a put a fence around it. Keep from ox yeah. to getting down in there. <laughs> uh, preparation of fix the problem. Yeah. Yeah. So the question I was going to ask was, so Brian, what was unique about this particular day? <laughs> that was my well, question before this, Tom jumped yeah, in there with this, it. This particular, well, it's a good thing. I wouldn't have known the answer if Tom hadn't helped me out. So, uh, you know, it's interesting. This, in, in the other gospel accounts, there's lots of miracles Jesus performs on the Sabbath. Sometimes he's in the synagogue in front of everybody on the Sabbath, and he says, I'm going to heal this guy. I'm gonna, and he'll ask him, hey, should I heal this person or not? You know, and they're, oh, because they can't answer. Uh, they'll look bad either way. So Jesus does all. But here in John, of course, again, we have limited miracles. It'll be this miracle and the miracle in John 9 where Jesus heals yeah. somebody on the Sabbath. Okay. Um, now, and as I said, what I think is interesting is I have to wonder, how did this man get to the pool in the first place? Uh, somebody yeah. had to have carried him and his bed. Well, if it's if it's work for him to carry his bed, it would have been much more work for somebody else to carry his bed as well as him to the pool. Could, they, could they have oh, lived in this area, okay. lived there? Kind of like a, a, a row for the sick people? I mean... Maybe. Maybe he stayed there all the time. I don't know. It would have been a difficult thing to imagine. Yeah. Um, so, but in this case, and, and what, what, it's a good point about the Bible never identifies other days that Jesus does healings on. I don't think, you know, it's not like on the fourth day of the week when he did this or that. It, I mean, he did heal people on other days, but it does specifically state Sabbath. In this case, a point though, the Jewish leaders did not see him do the healing. You know, that, that'll happen, like you're talking about, there were instances where he will heal in front of them on the Sabbath. What was the giveaway? It was the man carrying his bed. Yeah. <laughs> That's what stirred up the discussion here with that. They saw him and said, it is the Sabbath. Is it not lawful for you to, un is it not lawful for you to carry your bed? Am I reading that right? I think you read it, it as the question. Sabbath. Is it not lawful, but it, it, it oh, is. Oh, that's right. It is not lawful for you to carry your bed. That's right. Thank you. So what was his answer? Well, the man who healed me told me to take it up and walk. <laughs> you know, if a man's going to heal me and then tell me to take up my bed and walk, I'm going to do that. Yeah. Um, 
And of course, then they ask about him there in verse 12, who was the man? But Tom, he didn't know who that man was, was he? Not at this point. But they probably had no, a pretty yeah. good idea because there was only one yeah. man going around healing people. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, exactly. The, the Pharisees would have had a good idea. This man didn't know who it was. And incidentally, based on what we read here, as well as the fact that it said in verse 13, he withdrew himself, that lends me to believe that Jesus didn't heal everybody at the pool. That for some reason on this occasion, he singled this man out. And it, and, uh, and and also he did not make a big show out of it, which has already been brought up. You know, um, based on the fact that it says he withdrew himself and nobody knew anything until the man picked up his bed and walked. So, you know, it almost seems like this was a private and, if you will, a calculated healing. Jesus, okay. Jesus knew what was going to happen when he healed this man, even when he, uh, I mean, he, cause he's going to come back and see him, you know, and, and he's going to talk to him. And, and, and I think Jesus is just stirring things up, um, you know, in, in a sense, because he knows how the Pharisees feel about him, the religious leaders. Yeah. And, and, and this is one of those, uh, you know, I, I mean, just look at the picture, um, you know, we've told him to stop healing on the Sabbath and, and here he's doing it again and we can't catch him. Or, or or those types of things because that's 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 almost the picture that I get her. Jesus Jesus antagonizes these people from time to time. Um, but when I say that, it's well deserved. Yeah. It's actually something that is needed because their hypocrisy needs to be exposed. That's true. I've just looked at the time. We've got just maybe four minutes remaining. Um Real quick, let's look at the last two sections, for, or verses 14 and 15. Um, Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you have been made well. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. Any thoughts about that? I want to say several times Jesus tells the people he heals sin no more. I think in John chapter yeah. 8, the woman, uh, well, he doesn't heal her, but the woman in adultery. Um, and it is interesting because, you know, for all the bad things, something worse could happen to you. You know, being lame is pretty bad, you know, being a, a beggar and this terrible condition. But obviously the wages of sin are much, much worse. But he's not attributing the illness to sin. Right, 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 right. Yeah, at and least not as recorded. Yeah, at yeah. least not as recorded, you know. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and in John and chapter 9. Uh, yeah, in yeah. John chapter 9, that also is elaborated upon yeah. that, you know, when they ask him, who who sinned, this guy, so this this happened, and Jesus says, that's not, oh, oh. I'm just going to paraphrase, that's not how it works, that's not how these things work. So, yeah, yeah, exactly, and of course, you, you also have the example here of taking what happens physical and Jesus making the spi a spiritual application out of it. Absolutely, yeah. Just another example. And then the fellow departs, tells the Jews that it was Jesus who made him well. You know, and I agree with what you are saying. They probably had the, the leaders probably had a good idea who it was, um, but he, he identified him. All right. So we'll have to stop here. We'll pick up next week there in verse 16. And Brian, you touched on this earlier. This does kind of be one of the, the miracles that kicks off the persecution and ultimately the, the death of Jesus. Um, because not so much him doing the miracle as it was performing it on the Sabbath day. You know, that was, a, that was a, a direct action there. All right. You know, it'll well, say here, mm -hmm. it'll say here that they sought to kill him. In John 7, he'll say, you guys seek to kill me. And they say, we're not seeking to kill you. Yeah. And Jesus says, yeah, you are. You're seeking to kill me because I've done these works on the Sabbath. Yeah. So, he knows. He knew. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, I right. can read your minds and I can read your, <laughs> I, I, I know what schemings you're doing. <laughs> Don't use those words. But, but, but yeah, you are. You can deny it all day long. And let me just say this, too. We know Jesus never violated the Sabbath because of who he was. But we also had the testimony of the writer of Hebrews. He was tempted right. in all points like as we and yet without sin. If he had violated the Sabbath, that would have been a sin. That's right. And, That's a good and point. He, never, he never did that. He never went any further than the Sabbath day travel laws allowed him to because he never violated the Sabbath. 
You know, that's a very good point. Although he's Lord of the Sabbath, he never broke the Sabbath law that God had given. Yeah, that he had given. No, he observed it correctly. Yeah. <clears throat> and that's, that's probably a better way, way to of putting look at it. it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he, he observed it correctly. Yeah. All righty. Well, I'll tell you what, let's plan to continue this next Thursday. We'll pick up in John chapter 5, there in verse 16. I appreciate gentlemen being able to join me today. We missed uh, Brendan and Miss Paul. Hopefully we'll be able to have them back with us next week. And we'd like to thank you for taking time to join us for the study. If you weren't able to join us live, then uh, mark your calendars for Thursdays at 11 o'clock a.m. Central Time. Come to either our Facebook channel, which is our Facebook page, which is YouTube Live, or <laughs> at Truth Factor Live, and our YouTube channel, which is Truth Factor Live as well. Um, when we do, when we have our live studies, or if you're watching this at a later point in time, if you want to get in contact with us, please do that. You can uh, send it to questions at truthfactorlive.com. All righty. We'll see everyone then next week, next Thursday, 11 o'clock a.m. Central Time. You have a wonderful week. Bye-bye.